Welcome back to this next video in which we are studying headaches. Okay, so we're currently in the process of discussing the causes of intracranial hypertension, which remember means raised intracranial pressure. So when discussing the different causes for intracranial hypertension, it's helpful to categorize these according to the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. So remember the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, this is a fancy name for a principle that is actually extremely simple. And that extremely simple principle is that inside the skull, there are three major substances. And those three major substances are cerebrospinal fluid, brain tissue, and then blood. And if we're going to raise the intracranial pressure, the pressure inside the skull, we need to raise the amount of at least one of those substances in order to produce that increase in intracranial pressure. Therefore, when we're discussing intracranial hypertension, we can categorize the causes into those causes that cause an increase in the amount of cerebrospinal fluid, those causes that increase the amount of tissue inside the skull, and those causes that lead to an increased amount of blood inside the skull. And indeed, we've started in this spirit by discussing the things that can lead to too much cerebrospinal fluid inside the skull. And of course, too much cerebrospinal fluid is called hydrocephalus. So we're now going to move on to the things that can cause too much uh, brain volume inside the skull. So let me get a nice colour and I'll put the title in here. So we now want to discuss the things that can lead to uh, the amount of brain or the amount of tissue inside the skull increasing. So there are two things that I want to discuss here. And of course, one of them you're probably shouting at your computer screens. The one that you're probably shouting at your computer screens is brain tumours. And of course, this is one of the most famous causes of intracranial hypertension, and we will spend some time discussing brain tumours in just a moment. However, before we discuss brain tumours, I would firstly like to discuss the fact that inflammation occurring in the brain tissue can also lead to an increase in the amount of volume of brain tissue that is present inside the skull and therefore can lead to intracranial hypertension. So we'll do the more boring one first. So there is a fancy word for inflammation inside the brain and this is encephalitis. So encephalitis means inflammation inside the brain. So why could you get inflammation inside the brain? Well, one of the major things that can lead to encephalitis is infection inside the brain. Now, be aware that encephalitis strictly means inflammation inside the brain rather than infection inside the brain. But of course, infection will cause inflammation, so infection will cause encephalitis. So there are a number of pathogens that are capable of infecting the brain tissue. And the way that they generally get into the brain tissue is from the blood. So first they'll go into the blood and then they can get into the brain and cause an infection inside the brain. And of course, when you have an infection inside the brain, that will lead to inflammation occurring. So, in inflammation, we're going to bring in an inflammatory exudate, which, remember, is fluid from the bloodstream with lots of the proteins from the bloodstream that are anti-pathogen. They uh, can attack pathogens directly. And also, we're going to bring in loads of white blood cells from the bloodstream into the tissue fluid of the brain as well. Now, inflammatory exudate and white blood cells, these take up space and therefore we are going to be expanding the volume of the brain tissue when encephalitis occurs within the brain and therefore this can therefore lead to intracranial hypertension. So encephalitis is a cause of intracranial hypertension. Now, you might be expecting me to now go into a long list, potentially, of the pathogens that are capable of causing encephalitis. I'm not going to do that because there are so many different pathogens that are capable of causing encephalitis. Just know that there is a huge number of different pathogens that are capable of causing encephalitis. Thankfully, encephalitis is extremely rare, so it is extremely rare to get an infection in the brain, but it can occur. There are many different pathogens that can be the culprit. Uh, and that these different pathogens, there are examples from the different categories of pathogens. And so some of these pathogens will be viruses, some of them will be bacteria, some of them uh, can be parasites, both multicellular and uh, unicellular. 
So there are a huge number of para uh, sorry a huge number of pathogens that are capable of getting into the brain from the bloodstream and can then cause infections in the brain and then can lead to encephalitis, which is a cause of intracranial hypertension. Okay, so that's all I want to say on encephalitis. Now let's discuss brain tumors. So the first thing to say about brain tumors is a warning with regard to the name here. So brain tumors, this suggests that these are tumors of brain cells. Now, that is not quite true. When we talk about brain tumors, really what we use this term to mean is tumors that are inside the skull. So really this means intracranial tumors rather than actual tumors of nerve cells. Tumors of actual nerve cells are phenomenally rare. And the reason that tumours of actual nerve cells are so rare is because remember what a tumour is. A tumour is a mass of cells that are all dividing at a very fast rate. Nerve cells, neurons, they are terminally differentiated cells and terminally differentiated cells do not divide that much at all. Cells of the heart and cells of the brain, nerve cells, these are examples of terminally differentiated cells, and the cells in the heart do not divide. The cells in the brain do not divide. The cells in both the heart and the brain that you have at the moment are the same cells that you had since you were born. And this is the reason that uh, when you have a heart attack or a stroke, when great big portions of the heart and the brain die, um, that it's very difficult for the body to recover from that because the heart tissue does not have a good ability to regenerate itself. It cannot just m cause the muscle cells to divide and replace the ones that have died. And the same is true up in the brain. And I, for one, find it surprising that these two incredibly vital organs to the body, the heart and the brain, have such a low capacity to regenerate themselves. However, it is true. So nerve cells do not normally divide. They are cells that have complete breaks on the division process. So loads of molecular mechanisms inside the cells, uh, the nerve cells, are putting breaks on the division process and stopping nerve cells from dividing normally. This means that it is extremely unlikely that you will actually be able to produce a tumour of nerve cells because nerve cells really do not want to divide. It's the same reason that tumours of the heart are so rare because the cells have such powerful breaks on the division process and of course therefore it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to produce a tumour out of these cells where uh, the cells will, would have to be dividing extremely rapidly. So that's my first warning that when we say brain tumours we really use this term to mean intracranial tumours, tumours inside the skull rather than tumours that are actually originating from neurons. Tumours that are actually from neurons are phenomenally rare, okay? So with that warning let's now discuss the categorization of brain tumours. So we can split brain tumours into two categories namely primary brain tumours, which are very rare, and then secondary brain tumours, which are more common. So, let's start off by discussing secondary brain tumours. So, of course, a secondary brain tumour is a tumour that has arisen as a metastasis of a primary tumour that is elsewhere in the body. So, to give you an example, Let's say you might have a gastrointestinal tumour, so a tumour in the gastrointestinal tract, and this tumour is going to be metastatic. Now that means that this tumour is not a benign tumour, it is a malignant tumour, it is a cancerous tumour. As soon as a tumour becomes metastatic, uh, it's now cast, classed as cancerous, and if it's metastatic, it will also be invading the uh, local surrounding tissues. So remember, the two defining features of a cancerous tumour are that they are invasing, uh, sorry, invasive, they're invading the surrounding tissue, and they're also metastatic. And remember, what metastatic means is that the tumour throws off cells that will go into the bloodstream and can then circulate in the bloodstream to far off portions of the body, leave the bloodstream at those far off portions of the body, and then set up 
new tumours in these far off portions of the body and these new tumours will then be called secondary tumours. So going back to our example in the gastrointestinal tract, let's imagine we've got a cancerous tumour in the gastrointestinal tract. It will be throwing off cells into the bloodstream. These will be going into the bloodstream and they'll be coming out at far off sites. Some of them might come off in the uh, brain and then can set up new tumours inside the brain and those would now be called secondary brain tumours. Now note, those tumours will absolutely not be nerve cell tumours. They'll be tumours of some cell of the gastrointestinal tract. So um, we're calling this a brain tumour but of course it's nothing to do with brain tissue at all, it's just located inside the skull. So there's our first example of how this term brain tumour really means a tumour inside the skull rather than uh, a tumour that's actually made up of brain uh, material, specifically neurons. As I say, tumours like that are extremely rare. Okay. So that's what secondary brain tumours are, they are metastases of cancerous tumours elsewhere in the body. Let's now talk about primary brain tumours. So primary brain tumours are tumours that actually initially ra arise from tissues inside the skull. Okay, uh, so they are going to arise from cells that are actually inside the skull and cells that might actually uh, be inside the brain. Now, Primary brain tumours therefore do include tumours that are actually derived from nerve cells. However, they also include a whole bunch of other tumours, and these other types of tumours are more common forms of primary brain tumours than tumours actually arising from nerve cells. So what I now want to go through is the different types of cells that can give rise to primary brain tumours, and therefore go over uh, briefly some of the different types of brain tumours. So as I say, all primary brain tumours are extremely rare, and in fact, actually, I think I'll put that in as my first point here. These are all extremely rare. So now going over the different types then of primary brain tumours, which are going to arise from different cell types within the skull. Most primary brain tumours are what we call gliomas. So gliomas are the first type of primary brain tumour that I'm going to go over. And it's actually believed to be around 50% of primary brain tumours are going to be of this type called gliomas. Now let me stress again, primary brain tumours are extremely rare. However, within this collection of extremely rare types of tumours, the most common type is what we call a glioma. And I've just realised I've gone back to using the thin pen, so I'm just going to go back to the thicker pen, which I actually prefer. Um, so that's an explanation as to why the pen's about to get uh, thicker. So what is a glioma then? A glioma is a tumour arising from glial cells uh, in the brain. So this is a tumour arising from glial cells. Now, the two major types of glial cells that exist within the brain and from which gliomas can arise are astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. And let me just give you a little uh, bit of information about these types of cells. So let's start with astrocytes. So firstly, the motivation. The brain, it doesn't just consist of nerve cells. You have other cell types within the brain tissue as well, not just the neurons. You also have supporting cells, and these supporting cells around the neurons within the brain are called glial cells. One of the types of glial cells is called astrocytes, and these are called astrocytes because they look like stars. So astro is referring to astronomy, the study of the heavens and the stars, and sight, of course, means cell. So let me just draw a little picture of an astrocyte then. So again, it's got dendrite-like projections coming out like so. And again, the reason for these projections like so are so that it can, it can mediate or look after a huge part of the tissue fluid in the brain. So here is my picture of an astrocyte. So I've just sort of given you a suggestion as to what the function of astrocytes are. The function of astrocytes is to look after the extracellular fluid in the 
brain tissue. So remember, neurons are extremely important cells, and to keep the neurons healthy so that they continue to function correctly, we need to make sure that they are bathed in nice extracellular fluid. We need to make sure that this extracellular fluid does not become too rich in waste products. We need to make sure that this extracellular fluid has lots of nutrients in it, and we need to make sure that neurotransmitters don't build up to too high levels in this extracellular fluid. And looking after the consistency of the uh, extracellular fluid is the job of astrocytes. So dotted around the brain, you have loads of these astrocytes, the role of which is to look after the extracellular fluid. Now, when you have a tumour that arises from astrocytes, that is called an astrocytoma. So this is one of the major cell types from which primary brain tumours can arise. And when you have a primary brain tumour that consists of loads and loads of astrocytes that are all dividing far too rapidly, that is called an astrocytoma, and that is an example of a glioma. Now, the other major type of glial cell is the oligodendrocytes. So let's put this down here. So the second type of glial cell that I'm going to talk about are the oligodendrocytes. Now, I think I've mentioned these previously in this video. Uh, oligodendrocytes are the cells in the brain that are responsible for myelinating neurons. So, in the peripheral nervous system, the cells that are responsible for myelinating the axons of neurons are Schwann cells. In the central nervous system, it's a different cell type that has the responsibility of myelinating the axons of neurons, and this cell is by the name of oligodendrocyte. So, let me draw a quick picture of an oligodendrocyte. It is a very different shaped cell to a Schwann cell. So, you'll have the cell body, like so, and then you'll have processes coming off the cell body. And I'll complete these processes up later on after I've uh, completed the cell body. So here are lots and lots of processes coming off the cell body like so, and then we'll have the nucleus at the center. Okay, so here's the cell body of our oligodendrocyte, and off the cell body we have these processes of the oligodendrocyte coming off, and then what happens at the ends of these processes is that you have myelin sheath produced, and the way that the cell produces this is Imagine producing a very flat portion of cytoplasm, so this isn't what it looks like, but this will help explain how we're actually going to produce this. So imagine taking a rolling pin and flattening out this portion of the process of the oligodendrocyte, like I've drawn here. Imagine this is extremely flat, so it's still containing a layer of cytoplasm, but it's been rolled out so that it's extremely flat. So if I was standing on top of this, it would be extremely thin. If I chiseled down, I'd go through a layer of cell membrane, I'd then go through a very thin layer of cytoplasm, and then I'd go through the bottom layer of cell membrane. So there's this very thin structure here. And what you then do is you roll this around the axon of a neuron. So let me just draw in the axon of a neuron. Imagine that this represents the axon of a neuron. What we're going to do is roll this around it. And actually, to do the rolling, let me just take away the axon of the neuron. You'd have to really put the axon of the neuron up here. And then imagine rolling this up so that the axon of the neuron is going to be surrounded by loads and loads of layers of cell membrane, like so. So what it will end up with is just drawing a little picture of a cross-section of this. Imagine now cutting through this and seeing it in cross-section. What you'd end up with is something like this. Here's the axon of the neuron cutting cross-section, and then you've got this Swiss roll-like structure wrapping around like so. And the p pink line here now represents the full thickness of this. So it represents a two layers of cell membrane with a layer of cytoplasm in between, like so. Now, in the plasma membrane of this structure that we are creating here to wrap around the axon of a neuron will be lots of special lipids. Uh, special lipids of the myelin sheath, not the normal phospholipids that you have in the rest of the cell membrane. You make this out of special uh, phospholipids uh, that are uh, unique to the myelin sheath. Okay, right, so oligodendrocytes then, they are uh, producing myelin sheath 
therefore they're responsible for the myelination of axons of neurons in the central nervous system. And each one of these processes that comes off the cell body of the oligodendrocyte, it will have a myelin sheath on the end of it. And therefore a single oligodendrocyte can myelinate a huge number of neurons axons. And that's another major, well, that's one of the major differences between oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells. Schwann cells don't have multiple processes, they just have a single process coming off them and then one myelin sheath that will myelinate one neuron's axon. So a single Schwann cell just myelinates a single neuron, whereas oligodendrocytes, they do much more basically. They have multiple different processes coming off them and they will myelinate multiple different neurons. So, that's the explanation of what oligodendrocytes are. They are the cells responsible for um, myelinating the axons of neurons in the central nervous system. So, if you get a primary brain tumour that is derived from oligodendrocytes, i.e. consists of loads of oligodendrocytes that are all over-dividing, what is that called? That is another form of glioma and it's called an oligo dendro, and you might expect it to be oligodendrocytoma, however it's actually oligodendroglioma. Okay, so these are both examples of gliomas. Gliomas are the most common form of primary brain tumour, and they are tumours uh, that are derived from uh, glial cells. And these are two major examples of glial cells, astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. You find these all over the central nervous system tissue dotted around the neurons. When you get a tumour that forms from astrocytes, that's called an astrocytoma. When you get a tumour that is formed from oligodendrocytes, that's called an oligodendroglioma. All right, so that's gliomas discussed. Let's now discuss some other types of primary brain tumour. So the second most common type of primary brain tumour after gliomas is what we call meningiomas. So meningiomas. And of course you can probably work out what a meningioma is. This is a brain tumour that originates actually from cells within the meninges. So we know that the meningeal layers, they surround the outside of the brain. So these are tissues inside the cranial cavity, so they're inside the skull, uh, and there are loads of cells making up those tissues, and when you get a primary brain tumour that has originated from cells that make up the meningeal layers, we call that a meningioma. So what's the prevalence of meningiomas, or rather what fraction of primary brain tumours, or what percentage of primary brain tumours uh, are meningiomas? It's 20%, so they're the second most common type after gliomas. Next, the third most common type after meningiomas is pituitary adenomas. Now, uh, this is a tumour within the cranial cavity that is going to originate from the hormone secreting cells of the anterior pituitary. So let me just write down the name, pituitary adenoma. And this accounts for 15% uh, of primary brain tumours. Okay, so remember the pituitary gland. It consists of the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. And I will just draw a little picture of the pituitary gland here. So here is the pituitary stalk, and then we have anterior pituitary here and posterior pituitary here. Now, the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary are very different. Remember, the anterior pituitary actually has cells present within it, little circular cells within it that are responsible for secreting the hormones that the anterior pituitary secretes into the bloodstream. And these cells will be under the control of hypothalamic neurons up in the hypothalamus. In contrast, the posterior pituitary, that does not have special cells uh, in it. it. Instead, the secretory apparatus of the posterior pituitary is the axon terminals of neurons that have their cell bodies up in the hypothalamus. So remember, actually, the posterior pituitary is just an extension of the hypothalamus. Neurons that have their cell bodies up in the hypothalamus send their axons down into the posterior pituitary and then have their axon terminals in the posterior pituitary and release a uh, molecule from that uh, axon terminal, and that is going to be the hormone that is then secreted into the bloodstream. So the hormones that are secreted by the posterior pituitary are actually secreted by axon terminals of neurons. So we can refer to them as neurohormones because they're released by neurons. 
So, pituitary adenomas, they're going to arise from these cells of the anterior pituitary, these circular cells, and I might just even draw one of these cells, so they're very boring-like looking cells. They're circular cells with a nucleus like so, and they're under the control of neurons up in the hypothalamus, but they are separate cells that are not neural cells. Sorry, they're not neurons, they're not nerve cells. Uh, and these are in the anterior pituitary and they release the hormones of the anterior pituitary and different forms of these cells release the different hormones of the anterior pituitary. So examples, of course, of anterior pituitary hormones are thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotrophic hormone, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, human growth hormone. All of these are examples of anterior pituitary hormones. So if you get a brain tumour that is originating from these cells of the anterior pituitary, that is called a pituitary adenoma. An adenoma refers to a tumour of glandular tissue. Okay, and that's the third most common form of primary brain tumour. After these three forms of brain tumour, there are then rarer forms of brain tumour. So I'll now go into the rarer forms of brain tumour here in white. So these are extremely rare forms of brain tumour. So the rarer cells for a primary brain tumour to actually arise from are the actual neurons themselves, so very, very rare, and I'll actually make this rarer, rarer than the other forms of primary brain tumours. You can have tumours that actually arise from neurons themselves. Now, these sorts of tumours, they are, have loads of different names. They can arise in different areas of the brain and depending on where they arise they're given different names so we won't go into the names for these tumours but do be aware that they can arise from actual uh, nerve cell tissue but it is extremely rare to get a primary brain tumour that's actually derived from uh, neuron tissue. And then another very for sorry very rare form of primary brain tumor is what we call an ependymoma. So an ependymoma, dimoma, and this of course is a tumor arising from the ependyma, which remember is the epithelium that lines the inside of the ventricles. Uh, so it is possible for those cells uh, to give rise to a primary brain tumor, and when they do so, uh, this is called an ependymoma. Okay, so that completes my little discussion then of primary brain tumours. So overall, what we have seen then is these two things can cause an increase in the volume of brain uh, tissue inside the skull and therefore can lead to intracranial hypertension. So encephalitis and brain tumours can lead to intracranial hypertension and therefore can lead to this headache that is the symptom of intracranial hypertension. Of course, uh, the treatment for these two causes of intracranial hypertension will involve actually treating the underlying disease. So if you've got an infection in the brain, we will want to actually treat that infection to treat the intracranial hypertension. If you've got a brain tumour, we will want to actually deal with that brain tumour with the normal uh, tumour treatments, the anti-cancer treatments, uh, to actually treat the intracranial hypertension. So both of these uh, underlying pathologies for intracranial hypertension, you treat the intracranial hypertension by treating these diseases. So we'll have a break here. In the next video, we'll move on to how having too much blood inside the skull can lead to intracranial hypertension, and we'll go over the different examples of intracranial bleeds.